thanks for everybody. I know that was a relatively short break and, and for that reason, it's been a fairly long day. Um, we're kind of into the home stretch here on uh, a couple things. We did have a change in our um, agenda and which we had um, uh, a couple uh, interesting aspects of how foundations could possibly help support um, autism and aging. So uh, we have two people that will be um, joining us today. Um, again, um, uh, Dr. Alicia Halliday, who you were able to hear um, earlier in the day, help uh, lead this uh, excellent uh, um, panel of um, members from the autism community and possibly Orly um, Prutcher, um and from the Israeli Foundation and um, uh, so I don't see here yet. And um, so maybe what we'll do is start with you, Alicia, about okay. um, thinking about foundations. And um, you've been both at Autism Speaks and you've been uh, now at the Autism Science Foundation. For that reason, there's a lot of aspects that we've covered in topics here, uh, particularly around aging and that. And so I was wondering if there are thoughts that you have either from your organizations or other foundations about how we could be supporting this effort. And it can go anywhere from aging to RFAs. It could be thinking about uh, certain initiatives that you have underway. Um, any of that is on the table. Yeah, I mean, some of the things that come to mind and bear in mind that I've been actively listening and I'm so thrilled that some of the panelists are still still on, um, is that this is a huge issue that I think um, just started, you know, once you think you you kind of have a handle on it, I was hearing comments and uh, presentations that made me feel like I didn't really know anything about, I didn't really un totally understand the depth to which uh, there were questions that needed to be answered. So my first instinct is that this is not really something that one foundation is prepared to tackle by itself, right? So different autism foundations, we've all become really good at kind of like saying, okay, we're going to work together, but some, some of us are focusing on some things more than others. Um, and I think that this is one of those issues where we know so little, right? And I was so thrilled to hear from individuals uh, who are on the spectrum and then who are on the spectrum and have children on the spectrum. Um, and again, I, children, meaning it could be children of any age, but that the the breadth is so big that I think that this is a ripe area for collaboration. And we don't have to feel like we're, you know, each going to, to, to tackle it by ourselves, right? I think we've gotten pretty good on some of these other things about, you know, making sure that we're, that, that, you know, everybody's not duplicating. I think in this respect, we're not, nobody's duplicating, right? There's just so much that can be done. So that was kind of my first instinct that this is not something that one organization should lead without the full participation of others. Um, and also something that, and I'm glad, I'm so happy there was full participation by different stakeholders that should be done without full stakeholder input. So um, I know that, that we both feel the same way is that there's, um, that this really needs to be led by the needs in the community. And the community really is diverse too. So that's the other thing that struck me and it struck me on the panel and it strikes me every day that um, there are so many commonalities that, that bring the community together, but there really are a diverse set of needs. Um, there's really a diverse set of, of, of not just needs, but essential things. And then, and things that would, you know, would help a family, things that families absolutely have to have things that um, are shorter term versus other things that are longer term. And so I think um, really talking about heterogeneity has been helpful um, to make sure that we're not, you know, that, that, that the voices that we hear, we're recognizing that they are very diverse and that um, it doesn't make one better or worse. It doesn't make one more urgent or less urgent. It means that there's differences um, in, the, in people's needs uh, based on things like context and age and where you live and what your financial situation is and what the needs of your child are and, you know, how things evolve over time. So I think that it's great that we're saying that and we're talking about it because, you know, sometimes we don't, we just consider autism to be this giant construct that, um, or this giant thing that everybody fit under, 
fits under and, it, and it's just not. So those were the two things is that I think, you know, we need to make a collaborative effort and we need to be maybe, um, you know, think about where we can make impact first. And even if it's not for the whole spectrum, that maybe we fo- we start with a part of the spectrum or a part of the aging process or a particular need. I heard a lot of things, um, especially, you know, in the last couple of days, I won't say especially because there's there was a lot of things, but different areas of need, whether it comes to research needs or things around physical health or mental health or, you know, school or social supports or, you know, so, you know, that's another way to think of it as well. So I'm going to listen to the, to, um, the next person. That That's all excellent points, um, Alicia. And for that reason, um, I think this is why it's the beginning of a conversation here, because again, there's so much to tackle is the question of how to build those pieces out. And I think that's really really important. And it will take multiple stakeholders to really, I think, lift this up in some ways. And whether we have to bite it off in in pieces, um, as we've been hearing um, with so many of the neurodiversity and um, uh, heterogeneity in that, it it, uh, will be a complex problem. So, um, but um, uh, I see Orly has joined us. She is the manager, you know, at the Israeli Foundation from uh, manager of neurodiverse initiatives at the Israeli Foundation. So um, we are just talking about how foundations could play a role in thinking about uh, this problem of aging and autism. And I know you um, had in the past um, had some thoughts and uh, dwelled into this area. And I thought you maybe want to uh Talk a bit about that and how you think about we should be going forward. Certainly. So I really just want to start by saying thank you so much to Autism Speaks Foundation for even putting together this two-day summit. Um, I know that there's a lot of discussions that happen behind the scenes as much as what has happened on the screens today. Um, And I just really want to say kudos to all of the excellent speakers and all the different presenters and ideas that have been shared thus far. Um, Dean, thank you for mentioning the fact that this is an ongoing discussion at the foundation. Um, In 2019, our board made the strategic decision that aging um, is really a focus and a highlight for the neurodivergent population group that we are looking to support. And based on our early discussions with Autism Speaks, it is something that we are very much aligned on, and we're looking to see what will come about from these two days. Um, Unfortunately, I wasn't, my colleague Mira, Dr. Mira Puri and I were not able to attend both days in the full capacity that we would have liked to. We actually have our own internal board meetings happening at the moment. Um, But even more so, I'm very much looking forward to getting the recordings so that I can really both Dr. Puri and I could once again watch some of the sessions that we were not able to attend because there were so many important lessons and takeaways and concepts and ideas, as well as most importantly, as was mentioned yesterday at the summary, the participation of those with lived experience. So this is really just an opportunity to say, we are here, we are looking to support what it looks like, we'll have to wait to see and come. But this definitely is an area that we we know is important, we know is continuously being overlooked. And we had even done a smaller version of this type of roundtable discussion in 2021 to also again get the ball rolling. So we're just looking to see what comes our way and what that type of support will look like. So thank you so very much for all of the work that you've done and kudos to all the presenters and really thought out information. Thank you. And, you know, I, I think we've highlighted uh, throughout the conference places, you know, that we can all think about, um, for instance, like training. I mean, it was clear that training is going to be a, a very important role in um and, and really the future of this because of uh, many of these specialties and many areas that uh, do not have training in autism. Um, and I think that's been an experience that 
we found in, in funding a lot of like even pre and, and postdoc candidates, you know, as you get them into the field, they're taking this forward, but it's going to go beyond the research realm really into that critical, critical uh, aspect of, of the clinic. And really, how do we get more people? And I think uh, Joe Piven brought this up, the importance of uh, geriatric uh, psychiatry and how that can be built out. Um, so I think those are pieces uh, that we can think of. You know, the question is whether we can bite small pieces off, like you were saying, Alicia, thinking about maybe um, RFAs to target particular areas that we're thinking. Uh, it was clear on even thinking about the cohorts um, you know, what particular, uh, you know, uh, projects do we want to think of? What research um, interests are we looking at? So we can make targeted uh, pieces that way. You know, I, I'm thinking about the cohorts there and just, you know, what you're involved with, Alicia, too, about the Baby Sibs Consortium. You know, the, obviously, they're going to grow up at some time. So the question is, how do you continue to, you know, to collect individuals, you know, over a period of time? So you know, those are just some of the pieces besides the pieces we don't have answers for. So um, it will take a collective effort. And um, I think we're going to look forward to uh, collaborating uh, with, with you and, and many more people. And Dean, yeah, thank you for mentioning the cohorts. So many people on the panel, including Kathy and Marsha Malik and Joe Piven, um, and I'm probably Vanessa, are involved in a little group that Autism Science Foundation started where we're... Um, thinking about how these longitudinal studies that follow, you know, they could follow kids into school age, they follow people into adulthood, um, how they can be better, not better used because they're used to their, to, to as much as they can, but how can organizations support these projects because they're not cheap, they're not easy, and they could always use different supports um, to, to help make them go and to help um, answer questions in a, in a way that's efficient. So um, I, I just want to put a plug in for these longitudinal studies because they go underappreciated. Um, they're really quite remarkable and have led to, uh, you know, most of the findings that we're talking about here today. So um, I just wanted to put a, put a feeler out for that or a tickler out for that. Yeah. And also to just echo on that, um, and apropos what Maddie had shared in the chat, I men. Um, it's also the work of the foundation is very much about trying to support translational work. So where is it and how is it that we could take the information and learnings and lessons from research and how can then get implemented in improving the quality and quantity of services and supports that are being offered in the field. Um, and it's also the opportunity to leverage what the government is doing and help them better understand where funding needs to go and how so services need to be improved. Because um, as we know, this population group, um, autistic individuals are just continuing to thankfully live longer. And we wanna make sure that they have all of the supports that they need throughout life and making sure that they have quality of the same opportunities that neurotypical do as well. Absolutely. And that's why I think, you know, the multiple stakeholders here are going to be critical on what the next steps will be, because it will take the autism community as pointing out here, you know, what will be outcomes and what will be quality of life issues that we'll want to tackle in that. And since this is at the very beginning, uh, as Alicia has pointed out, we don't have a lot of information here at all. So it is really quite new. And for that reason, we can build it together. So I'm excited about that. Um, I know we're at the end of our time here because uh, we do have one more important uh, discussionary panel and we wanna get to that. So I appreciate both of you coming on on, on short notice and having a little bit of discussion about how foundations can uh, be involved with this. And we thank again for all your efforts. Thank you for having this meeting. This was really important and a very important topic that um, embarrassingly doesn't get enough attention. Yeah, very good. Thank you all.